Forum. Um, just welcome all members who are attending in person and also via Starleaf. Today we will consider a departmental briefing on unadopted roads and a further departmental briefing on the A5 and the York Street interchange. Um, just advise, as usual, those um, who are joining us remotely um, to ensure that your mics are muted and to raise your hand at each um, agenda item which you wish to, to speak upon. Um, and also just um, remind you that we have to vacate the room um, by 12 p.m. at the latest. Um, so just remind you to keep that in mind as well. Um, apologies, I haven't received any apologies this morning. Um, do members have any apologies for other colleagues? No, okay, we're silenced, okay. Um, moving then to a chair's business, I suppose, really just to stage, just to highlight um, the issues in relation to the um, the driving test application system. Obviously, there was um, quite a number of um, very anxious learner drivers who wished to um, get a, a, a driving um, test allocation on Monday, and I know that the system was very um, much overburdened. Um, it might be useful for us to receive an update, um, and, I, and I appreciate that the minister did make a statement with regards um, to that, and obviously the um, the additional sites and so on that become available. But I am aware, that, as our members at our last briefing, that that there was a, they were a little bit light on the detail as to how that was going to be resolved. So if we could ask for further information as to what um, actions are being taken to ensure that there are more um, test slots available. Okay, members content. Okay, moving then to our draft minutes at page six. That's for the meeting of the 5th of May. Are members content? Great. Matters arising at page 13 again for the same meeting. Do members have any issues that they wish to raise in respect of that? No, all content. Okay. Is anyone else indicated? Okay. Um, moving then to outstanding um, committee requests for information, as you'll see from. Um, from the grid that's been in your in your papers, that there are still quite a number of pieces of correspondence which are outstanding, and you see beside that actually the update with regards to um, the number of um, requests that we have made for further information with regards to that, and send a, sent us reminder emails. So we have one which is outstanding from the 10th of December to the Department of Health, and that there have been five um, reminders sent. So it, it might be something that we wish to raise with the with the committee, um, with regards to responses. So if you're if members are content that we write to the health committee. Yes, if that's a so, process that we could use. Yeah. Okay. Moving then <coughs> to correspondence, and just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page twenty one, and also tabled at page three. Um, there are a number of items of correspondence that maybe met, that have actually a note for members to discuss, um, and, and happy to take that in turn. There's, there's, uh, there is a page 23 is correspondence from the Bus and Coach NI Limited regarding new draft guidance for commercial bus service permits and um, transport integration. And um, Mr. Buchanan, did you have something to say in relation to Bus and Coach Northern Ireland? Yeah, I did, uh, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we, yes, we can. Yeah, just, just to make our communication a um, few days to a couple of coach stroke bus operators regarding what's the plan for the scheme. Obviously, the schemes that they had, I understand, finished on the 31st of March and took it up to that financial year. But going forward, okay, let's say some businesses have a uh, uh, some buses could be doing, you know, EA work or, or school runs, for example. But then other parts is doing the very much the tourist aspect. What's going to support those from now to most of this financial year? Because ultimately, they will have no income. They were the first to close, and probably going to be the last to open for tours, tours, etc. So it's just a good harm if the committee would agree to probably write to the minister to see what additional schemes she's bringing forward to support that sector. 
because nothing's happening and, and obviously the, the tourist aspect of that and considering there's a scheme in place uh, by the Department of Infrastructure, it would be obviously easier for that to continue on and to give some support for that sector. Just That's my thoughts on it. Okay. Um, are members content in order to raise that? This, um, the correspondence is, um, in, with regard to that item um, is in relation to the, the permits and, and transport integration as well. So obviously there have they have concerns with regard to that. Are members content that we that we forward that to the department with a, a query associated with that too? Yeah. Okay. Chair, chair. Fair point. Yes. Um, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, yeah, the point has been made about integration of our um, uh, public transport system and um, the issue of uh, has been raised with me that that um, uh, <coughs> a wide variety of regular bus services are not being included in the journey planner, uh, whereas in other parts of the UK that is happening. Um, so I'm just curious as to why uh, public money paid through the journey planner is not being used to make the public uh, uh, aware of bus services, all bus services that are being provided. Um, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just in relation to, to the draft guidance, I mean, the, the, the bus and coach representatives have said there that they, they, they believe the new guidelines are unhelpful to the industry and that they've come about without um, proper consultation. And they do feel very strongly about wanting to meet with the minister and officials to discuss these changes. So I was going to propose that we write the minister um, as well to ask her to engage with the sector in relation to this. Um, and also, if we could maybe at the committee reach out to them to see if they want to raise the con their concerns directly with us as a committee. Because, I mean, experience has shown us some of the issues we've had over recent months, and, and uh, Mr Buchanan raised some of the points there as well about the difficulties they've been facing. So I think it's important that, that there's a, um, proper engagement with them on this as well. Okay, we have, we've, I suppose we have similar, or not unrelated, um, correspondence from Hannon Coach with regards to something similar with regards to um, the bus service permit applications. So that may be something that if the committee are content that we, we make arrangements to have those discussions. Chair. Agreed. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Hannans are obviously they're actually neighbours of mine uh, as well as uh, constituents. So I'm very happy to support their request. But I do think we need uh, some understanding uh, from the department uh, uh, on how the uh, permits have been changed uh, in terms of the guidelines and what that means for the private sector. So I'd like to hear more from the department in relation to that as well uh, as give the operators an opportunity to present their case. Okay. Well, if, if members are content that um, we can liaise them sure. with... Oh, Mr Boylan? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I appreciate all that's been said, but um, there's an opportunity for some of these groups to come in, especially the Hannon wants to they ask for a meeting with the uh, committee. So, I mean, is, is, it, is it acceptable to just write to the minister? I mean, coming out of some of these people in this, no? On the basis of the conversation that we've just had, that um, we liaise with the department to have them come to brief the committee and also arrange then for those who have written to us to also come. So we could have a, a session in relation to um, this particular item. Fair if enough, members, Chair. If members are content to do that. Agreed? Agreed. I, I agree, Madam Chair, but can also suggest we perhaps have the operators in before the department so we're aware are better informed, fully informed before we meet the department themselves. Well, we can we can we can arrange that um, depending obviously on um, diary slots for everyone involved in that. Okay, members content. Okay, um, other items of um, correspondence. Item. Do members have any particular issues that they want to raise? There's a, there's correspondence from the. Committee for the Economy regarding participation in meetings with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Um, they are suggesting that this be done via correspondence, if members are content to note that. Okay. Um, we've dealt with the Hannon coach request. Um, we've also received correspondence from um, the Committee for the Executive Office um, regarding the transfer of functions order, which has obviously been, been long 
awaited by, by everyone. Um, members, any issues with regards to that are content to note? I think it's just okay. important to move as soon as possible. Absolutely. Um, we've got the um, annual accounts and reports at tabled at page four. And then at um, page seven, we have advice with regards to the taxi driver's financial assistance scheme. And it's really whether or not members wish to arrange either a formal or an informal meeting with the taxi operators. And I'd be um, content to be led by members of the committee at this stage. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, so we'd be happy to engage with the taxi operators. We just need to doubly confirm that there is no legal action underway. I think the advice we've got is that there isn't any, but we just need to doubly check that and just the purpose of the, what the engagement was, because I think some of it was to investigate the decision making process by the Minister. Um, that's entirely different than sort of taking soundings in terms of the need for support and stuff like that. So we just need to understand sort of the terms of what we're engaging on. Okay. Our members contend that that's explored and then um, arrange uh, a meeting with the operators. Yep. Members content? Yep. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other items that members wish to comment on with regard to correspondence? Are you content to, um, to note the, the memo as agreed? Just agree the memo? Okay, thank you. Yep. Great, thank you very much. Um, moving then to item six, which is the departmental briefing on unadopted roads. Um, Hansard will record the meeting. Our briefing paper is at page 86 of your pack. Um, and can I welcome and attending via Starleaf, we have Connor Lockery, the Director of Network Services, and Lionel Walsh, the Network Planning Manager. Good morning. You're both very welcome to our session this morning. So we can hear. We can't hear anyone at this stage. Okay. Is that, that better? That's that's loud and clear. Thank you very much, Connor. Um, if, I could yeah, just, okay. if I could just ask okay. you to um, open with your statement and then members will follow with some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Last time I was here, it didn't work that well, but it uh, seems to be hopefully a bit better today. So listen, um, thank you for the invitation to committee to, to brief you on, on adopted roads. And with me is uh, Lionel Walsh. Lionel is the Network Planning Manager in the Eastern Division, but he is also the chair of the Private Streets Working Group, which uh, uh, takes oversight of private streets across uh, Northern Ireland. So this issue has come to um, committee before. It's been, been discussed, and it's most, most notably there was an inquiry in 2012, and there was certainly enough, a lot of um, positive recommendations and outputs bits from that and uh, and we'll come back to that later. Um, in, in terms of background then, um, the, most of you will be aware of this, but the, the department manages the adoption of new roads that are determined as part of the, the planning process. And when, we, when we say determined, well, that means it's suitable for adoption into the maintained road network once it is uh, completed in, in, in accordance with the approved drawings. So once plan permission is received, um, we work with developers and uh, and lenders and uh, bond companies to progress the adoption of the development roads um, in a timely fashion. And the legislation used for this particular process is the it's the Private Streets Northern Ireland Order 191980. And it's probably first worth emphasising that um, private streets within residential developments, it's a, it's a de developer-led process and the vast majority of progress to adoption without the need for any intervention uh, by, by the department. Um, the department were committed to ensuring uh, developers provide um, road infrastructure to a, a standard suitable for adoption and we ultimately do that really through, through the planning process. There are a number of stages. Um, as part of the planning application, we'll make sure that the, the standards used are appropriate. Um, once that is done, then the, the, the private street is determined as part of the, the, the planning permission. Um, developer takes out a bond, road constructed, uh, and 
and adopt it. And so that's the, the, the theoretical process. And I'd have to say it works well most of the time. There are occasions where it doesn't, but uh, um, for the most part, it works well. So um, it's illegal for a developer to commence works in new developments without having a, 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 an Article 32 agreement and bond in place. This ultimately allows the department to bring any development up to adoption standard should, should the developer for any reason fail to do so. Now, typically, um, a bond would be a surety from a bank or an, uh, another lender. Um, but on occasions, uh, it's been known to be a, a cash deposit. I mentioned earlier the, the CRD inquiry in 2012, and there's, uh, there are a number of very helpful recommendations uh, and actions coming out of that. And, and one related to the, the role of solicitors in the, in the entire process, um, which, is, which is very important. And certainly since that engagement with the Law Society in 2012, there's now a greater awareness amongst solicitors of the importance of a bond being in place when purchasing a property. And they certainly have moved in that direction, and that probably has been singularly the, the, the biggest factor that has, that has, that has helped reduce problems uh, going forward. A second issue that came out at the time was the adequacy of the bond, and uh, that was something that was reviewed uh, at the at the time. And uh, the the issue being that sometimes it was insufficient to to fund the completion of remedial works. Now, it is sometimes since it was last reviewed, and this is something that can only be be cleared by a minister. And we are currently updating previous submissions in relation to bond rates, and we'll uh, we'll shortly be bringing something to to the minister on that. So, looking at what we do within our private street teams and our and and our out, and our outputs and our capacity. You know, that capacity reduced in 2015. You'll be aware of the, the need at that time to reduce staff numbers to align with uh, the, the resource budgets that are available. And at that time, we lost a significant number of experienced private streets inspectors. And the upshot of that is that that has reduced our capacity to, to take enforcement action where a developer has either commenced without a bond in place or indeed at the other end of the process when they fail to, to complete the, the development. But um, despite having limited resources, um, we have adopted over 2,600 new private streets and developments. Now it says in the in the text that it's 10 years. These are figures actually for, for eight years. And over that same period, there's a, a total bond value of about 120 million. So on average, this equates to approximately 330 new streets developments um, being adopted each year uh, on average. And... Uh, and Equally, in the bond side, in terms of releasing bonds, we're, we're averaging about fifteen million pound per year. So during that same period, then we've also issued uh, two hundred and twenty-three enforcement notices to developers to developers who have failed to complete um, developments, and all this is really summarised in the in the next table. Then you can see over the last eight years the value of the bonds, the bonds in place, and, and in very simple terms, what's saying to me is that you know, we, we adopt about 10% of sites, 10 to 15% of sites each year, and we're, we're, we release about 10 to 15% of, of, of bonds. But coming in at the other side, then those are replaced by similar, similar numbers added back into the process for, for, for new developments. So um, a third action then coming out of the, the inquiry in 2012, we introduced uh, a new policy to put in place a system for prioritizing backlog sites. And what that does, it seeks to prioritize them predominantly on the basis of need and, the, and in particular the length of time the, the, the development has been 80% occupied. That is a, a key consideration. Um, one of a number of considerations because not only do we look at the level of development, it's also very important to understand and consider the issues within individual developments. Um, a few other points worth mentioning. Um, over the last number of years, we've th there've been a, a significant number of older backlog sites that were in place around the time of the, the property crash in 2007. Thankfully, the num those numbers are reducing. Now. As, as, as works get done and their sites are bought over by new developers. But there are still some sites that remain un, unadopted for a number of reasons, um, and, and we're looking to take those forward. 
Also, in, we've noticed in recent years, there's an, an increasing trend for developers not to offer road infrastructure for adoption and, until the, the housing is completed in its phase. And this presumably is a, a, a cash flow issue for developers and the need for house sales to fund uh, com completion uh, of infrastructure. So, um, I mentioned the, in terms of prioritizing sites, that uh, the the level of what the issues are within a site and, and the level of occupancy and the third factor is also um, something that we consider is wh what are the chances of the, the development being completed. Um, so an issue is wh whether the, the developer is still trading or, or, or not and that is another um, important factor in our consideration. Because when they're still trading, um, the, the best way to do yes uh, to progress the completion of sites is to work closely with developers and encourage them to to, to complete them as uh, as soon as they can but very often this would not be this would be slower than than residents would like and that's um uh, quite common but certainly if it is evident that a developer is unwilling or unable to complete the the, the works to a required standard we will consider uh, um, enforcement action um, worth pointing out as well that there are some cases um, where we can't use the, the enforcement processes to carry the works, and that's typically where there are, are, are land issues um, or access issues. That is something that, that we can't use the Article 11 process to to, to deal with. Um, so, uh, so again, the way forward there is to try and work with developers and residents to resolve outstanding issues. So. Um, mindful also that in looking at the sites, there are many sites that have issues in relation to Northern Ireland water infrastructure, and we, you know, we recognise that. And there's a there's a number of uh, legacy sites, and certainly we're working with Northern Ireland Water to to um, to try to identify those long-standing sites and to get those uh, moved and, and completed. And and certainly I'm aware that no. And Ironwater are proactively looking at this at the minute to, to try and identify the, the high priority sites and to come up with a comprehensive list of, of, of sites and what the, the, the problems may be. So finally then, just um, in relation to, as well as uh, unadopted roads that are part of the, the private streets order pro process, there, you'll be aware that there are a number out there that really sit out of that, outside of that. And there is provision in the private streets order to adopt such sites, but as with any development, the you know it's a prerequisite that it needs to be brought up to an adoptable standard before the department would would, would take that on. And just to give that a, a sense of of scale, there was a study done about ten years ago, and it was identified that there was over six hundred and twenty kilometres of unadopted roads and laneways. That's that's those that sit outside the private streets process. Um, and the cost of bringing that, that up to uh, standard would be something of the order of three hundred million pounds. So clearly, it's simply not feasible for, for you know, given the department's budgetary position, wouldn't be feasible for for the for the department to be um, trying to, to contribute to upgrading up those sites. So, Chair, that's really a quick run through the um, the, the paper, and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Connor. Um, that's very much appreciated. Um, this is obviously an issue which is um, which all members can relate to um, the number of sites across each of their constituencies, um, and obviously you've noted the um, the work which was carried out by the the, the committee back in two thousand and twelve. Um, but really, I suppose you've only highlighted a couple of the recommendations which were made, which were obviously in relation to drawing much more greater awareness for solicitors around this particular issue. Um, but I suppose the, the one which, which concerns me is the fact that the level of the bond, um, which was identified as an issue back in 2012, um, it's been now quite a considerable time since the um, committee deliberated on this and made the recommendation with regard to that. Um, and yet, there has been no change in the rates since um, sort of prior to the committee's um, inquiry. So I mean, we're considerable time down the road, before, and we still haven't actually addressed the issue of the rates. And that's something which you're now, you've now noted that you are currently looking at and preparing for the minister. I mean, what has been the delay with regards to that, given the fact that this has been an outstanding issue? 
um, and you have identified that there are obviously issues yeah. around staffing and so on in order to um, to progress this. But whereas if you know some of some of the issues may have been addressed by increasing the bond <coughs> in the first instance. Um, yeah. Uh it's a, a couple of issues there. It's it's firstly any decision to change the bond can only be made by a minister, and this was, uh, you know, I think uh, cases were made to to previous ministers um, for consideration, and then obviously there was a period of time, you know, when we were without ministers. So this is something now that we've always been um, aware of, and we're refreshing what has been done previously, and we will certainly be bringing that shortly to um, our minister for consideration. Um, there obviously a no there were a number of recommendations that were made um, by the committee, and I was just wondering what the status of the other recommendations were, or whether they were being considered. And I suppose, in particular, I'm, I'm, consider I'm thinking about uh, a time limit on bonds and whether that has been um, considered in any detail. Um, Chair, just uh, I think we wrote the minister wrote to the committee to provide an update on those recommendations uh, around February, March, um, and but in relation to a time limit, are you are you talking about um, a time limit at the at the end for before enforcement would would kick in? Is that what you're? Yeah, I think we, we're all mindful of the fact, and you've mentioned um, legacy sites and the fact that you have um, obviously people that. Um, leave the sites and, and don't bring them up to a standard and as a consequence of that then um, residents have to um, to deal with deal with the consequences of that um, and of course time passes and perhaps businesses um, cease to exist um, but it was just an, if there had been uh, if there was a, a time limit on a bond that might focus minds a little better um, particularly for those involved in the conveyancing side, but also um, the, the developers um, and the, the various agencies that are obviously um, will need to be involved uh, at the completion of um, bringing um, a site up to the required standard. Yeah, you will certainly work in some way at the mercy of developers because it's, it's they who decide what what portion of or or what phases of site needs to, needs to be to be bonded, and we certainly it's rather than a time that it's an occupancy um, trigger we have for that. And, and once the site gets past eighty um, percent um, occupied, then we will consider it for enforcement. Obviously, that's only one criteria, and we need to look at what the the specific issues are and whether developers trading, um, because ultimately, you know, it is primarily a developer's responsibility, and if they're um, still trading, certainly the, the the best and most efficient way for this is to um, to uh, put a bit of pressure on developers to get to get sites finished. I suppose I think I, I'd probably be a bit more satisfied if you said if you were saying to me when whenever we're looking at the submission to go to the minister in relation to rates that we may look at some other suggestions in relation to that as well. Um, because it, while while the rates is, is is an issue, I think there there are are other considerations that should perhaps be looked at. Um, you have mentioned that um, some sites that remain unadopted due to sewage and road issues, the department has no powers to remediate. And obviously, the concern is that you know, sort of, the longer that uh, a bond is in place, obviously, the lesser value that it is as well. And there have been instances which I mean, I've come across where the bond can't cover the cost of the works required, um, while the developer company has been wound up. Or, or can't meet the obligations either. So it's really, I know that you've said that you are working alongside um, Northern Ireland Water to identify some legacy sites, but I suppose really it's about what's being done to identify the measures that you could take um, to address those issues, either in partnership with Northern Ireland Water or, or actually seeking the powers in order to, to do something about it. Yeah, well, we say that, um, that we're looking at the sites that will look at what the issues are and what is needed to to complete those individual sites um, and you know, there are a number of issues there around inspection bond and what the responsibilities are and you know whether it's an old developer or, or a new developer or a surety you know there's there's um, a number of ways that this can be progressed and uh, and they, but it's really a case of you know each site that need to be looked at uh, on, its, on its merits. Okay. Well, I suppose really, just a final comment, really is I suppose there's an assumption whenever a development 
starts and then whenever it's completed by those and, and all the residents move in, there will be an assumption that that development will become part of the, the, the road network and will, will become adopted. And I suppose it's really um, the role which um, the department plays sort of throughout that process um, mm -hmm. to ensure that that's done in a, in a timely manner. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree totally, and I, I think a very useful lesson the last time was getting the solicitors on board with that, because we're all aware of, of, of sites where there um, are no no bonds, and we certainly have every sympathy with, with residents of any developments where there are difficulties, but certainly when there is no bond, the, the, the difficulties are even are even greater, uh, as we're aware. So certainly that piece of work has, has, has gone a long way towards ensuring that there are bonds in place. Obviously, there are, you know, the... the, the adequacy of the bond is something that that we're looking at but uh, you know I think it's re you know it's it's working reasonably well at the minute if you look at the numbers in the tables in terms of bonds in place um you know versus the the the, the level, you know the number of sites that require enforcement action you know certainly the vast majority um are, are progressing as they should yeah and I don't and I, and I and I don't doubt that and and obviously it's very much dependent on the housing market and we went through a period of time where sites were left, um, sort of abandoned sites, really, for want of a better term, um, during um, the, the downturn, which has created there was many of those legacy problems that you have. But I suppose it's just to be mindful of sort of lessons learned from that period as well, moving forward. Okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. A lot of those legacy sites, you know, the time of the property crash, you know, it was very problematic. You know, coming out the other side of that, we're seeing that, uh, you know, a number of sites are being bought over by other developers, you know, de developers inquiring about what um, individual problems there are at specific sites. Uh, you know, and we, we do have examples of where they're bought over new bonds and, you know, so the, so the market has improved, obviously, and that's obviously to, to, to everyone's benefit. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> You're very welcome, gentlemen, this morning. Um, would you be able to share with us perhaps the number of staff and, and figures that you're actually short, short off at the minute, and how many it would take to run a much more efficient system or bring it up to scratch? Yeah, well, certainly at the minute we have off the order of about 20 staff working in private streets, you know, and uh, so those 20 staff are covering, you know, all the, uh, you know, the 3,470, you know, you know live bonds that we have in the minute, plus the uh, enforcement cases. Now, uh, as I mentioned previously, in uh, 2015, we obviously had to, the department had to cut us cloth to suit in terms of, of staff numbers, and, uh, but Prior to that, we had, you know, we had approximately double the number of staff that we have uh, at the minute working at that time. So we've had to do things, you know, differently, and we've sort of nearly moved into reactive mode rather than proactive mode. Um, so to to get back to um, a, to a proactive mode and uh, you know to be better placed to know numbers of sites and levels of occupancy, you know, it would need to to go back to to those. Um, Pre-reduction levels. How, how were those? Uh, <clears throat> how were those jobs lost? Were they just people leaving to go to other work, or were there cutbacks required, or what was the reason that we're now sitting at what fifty percent of what we had? Yeah. Well, you know, at that at the time when the department had to, you know, look at its staff structures and and match its structures to its uh, available resources. Budgets, um, you know, there's a lot of the things that the department do that are, you know, that are mandatory and legal requirements, um, uh, whereas other things have a more of a discretionary level. Um, you know, so a lot of the 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 changes were absorbed by you know, by retirements. You know, there, there was no redundancies per se. It was all everybody was it was um, some were reallocated within other parts of the department and some, as I say, were um, retirement, just uh, uh, natural vacancies occurring. So that, that would have been a mistake from the department then to rationalise so heavily. Would that be correct? No, it was it was we have to 
put our teams in to reflect the budgets that we have. So you know, so the starting point is what you know, what what is the available budget you know for staffing, and we have to um, re resource the functions then um, within that budget. So it's it's not it's, I wouldn't say it was a mistake. It was something that we were um, forced to do to stay within our budgets. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the, the bonds, which add up to quite a considerable amount of, of, of money. What happens to those bonds once they're paid over to the department? Right. Um, the bonds, when they come in, they're held. Maybe Lionel, keep me right here. They're they're held until such a time. Um, it's a, it's essentially a, 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 a guarantee by a, a surety. Typically, there's the odd cash one, but but they're held then. No, I'm just wondering. I know what they're held within the well, held wherever. Uh, but wh where are they actually held within the department? Are, are they potentially because of the nature of the size of the huge sums involved? Do, are they put away in an investment? Or are they just no, no, no? They're typically they're not. You know, for the most part, there's very few that are, would be cash ones. Most of them would be an agreement. The, you know, wouldn't involve cash at all. It would be a, an undertaking from a, a you know from a, a, a bank or a a surety company, so uh, so there wouldn't be um, cash to be invested per se. It would be a, it's it's a written agreement, it's a legal agreement. Okay, thank you. And the, have sensitivity studies been considered on the eighty percent occupancy criteria? Could or should that be reduced slightly? Uh, and due to the nature of the own constituency in, in, in Carrick and Larne and that. You know, problems getting bin lorries in and, and gritters onto sites if they if they if they qualify. Uh, would, would it be worth looking at a, a, another percentage, let's say, uh, to try and assist people who live on these sites? Yeah, um, well, well, certainly there was an exercise done around the inquiry time in 2012, and local government put that was an action the last time that we should be discussing this with. Local government and and Nilgay did carry out a review. He did a pilot at the time and, and had a look and did a bit of work. And they concluded that they were quite happy with what we were doing. That the problem sites were were coming to the top and they were kind of came to the same list that we did. Um, you, you know, so it seemed to be in terms of identification sites, it it worked okay. I suppose the difficulty is it's it's well, you know, regardless of what you you put it to, um, you know, the the one hundred eighty percent, um. Occupied will naturally remain a higher priority than those that are seventy percent occupied. Um, you know, and as I suppose it's limited in terms of what we can do at, at the minute. You know, so we've issued two hundred and twenty-three over the last eight years. You know, and it's the same teams that are doing that that are doing the managing the sites that don't go down the enforcement route. You, you know, and you can see even from the table that the more live sites we have and more ongoing sites, um, you know, there's probably less time for, for, for enforcement, but then that's probably a better place to be because we want things to be done naturally and properly rather than have to put down uh, an enforcement route. Okay, thank you. And I hope we can get to a better place on this subject moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr Beggs. Hello, uh, and again, thanks for your, your background uh, information, Connor. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of why there has been such a, a large difficulty. Um, you said that it's illegal to commence work without a bond. Uh, can you advise, in terms of the problem sites, uh, how many of them fit that category? Have, have the developers developed without a bond? No. I think the key thing there is that that nearly becomes now that the solicitors are are dealing with this as it should be, um, then that has become less of an issue because um, the you know through the property certificate and through the legal inquiries they're asking the question if a bond is in place, and you know so it's it's really um, it's in the developer's interest in terms of trying to um, attract people to buy the property because it, um, their solicitors will pick up at an early stage if it's not bonded, and that has been um, very yeah, that has encouraged developers to take out bonds. My question still remains of the problem sites that we hear here about, particularly ones where there may not even be adequate uh, sewage systems in place, which are 
you know, hugely problematic for the people uh, living uh, in such areas. How many of them were developed without bonds in place? I just I wouldn't have figures to hand out. You would need to know. You know, uh, we can certainly yeah. find out what in relation to any individual sites, but I wouldn't have numbers. But can you come back to us with information? Sites. And in particular, how many have been prosecuted for having developed without bonds in place? Yeah. Okay, we can see we have. say it's become less of an issue because the the, the more market forces the developer to take out yeah. bonds, but yes, yeah. there may be the long-standing ones. Um, okay. It'll be that I can so see if you can find out. Many, develop, many um, areas are developed by the developer setting up separate um, ring fence companies so they can, uh, if something goes wrong on one site, it's not going to affect their, their overall company uh, or group of companies, shall we say. So my question is, if, if a uh, site was developed without a bond, perhaps went bust, because I think that's been a, a factor in all of this as well in, in, in 2008. Have, or is there still uh, the directors who were involved at that stage, even if the company has since been liquidated? Because in a day, those individuals took a decision to develop a site without a bond. So has that ha occurred? Uh, not that I am aware of. I think our, our capacity to do anything after a, you know a company goes out of business is, is extremely limited. But I would hope in the modern day that that in such sites where there's no bond, that there's no properties being sold because the solicitors are advising their, their prospective purchasers accordingly. Would I, I mean, my my understanding of legislation is all along. Um, if you're if you're getting a solicitor to do due diligence and a transaction. Uh, checking out whether there was a road bond in place or not would be a reasonable thing to require your solicitor to do. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, have you been advising uh, any such householder to uh, seek compensation from their solicitor and through the law society? Because I would have thought that is where much of the difficulties occurred, where uh, all the due diligence that should have been carried out were not carried out by the solicitors involved in the transactions. Yeah, you know, it, it certainly has come up again. You know, it, it's it's a small number of sites that you know that we find ourselves in this in this position, um, and certainly if there's no bond in place, um, you know, that, that is the line we take. You, you know, that that, that is, is something that should have been checked by solicitors at a time, and um, what okay. they do uh, thereafter is matter for themselves. Uh, just on, on the matter of um, the level of the bonds, um, you now the department uh, and, and now Northern Ireland Water, they collectively you t you say what the level of bond is. If you get it wrong and you're required to take enforcement action and to draw down the bond, can you confirm that you pick up any additional costs if you got the figure wrong, or does the work simply not get done because of your mistake? Well, uh, there's, there's, uh, that could go a number of ways because it's a, you, you know, there's a definition in the legislation around who is a responsible person. So, you know, it, so it could well be, you know, the developer remains liable even if there is a shortfall, or the surety does, you know, um, possibly even the property owners. You know, so again, it's a matter of looking at each, uh, you know, looking at the individual circumstances of, of each case and, and seeing what the, the the best way through it is. So, sorry. So you're saying if you set the bond incorrectly. A company goes bust. The those who have bought their houses in, in in good faith have no protection. No, if, if, okay, so it's, if the bond is inadequate and the developer is bust, um, no, I would have thought that there's a certain a, a case to be made there. Um, you know, without having the, the full circumstances of, of a site, um, you know, you know, I couldn't give any commitment, a, a general commitment. I think we have to look at the. The, as each, each head on its merit. So again, I'm just going to, it's quite an important issue. As you're saying, if, if, if the developer still exists, he carries the, the, the responsibility and the occupants sh probably should be pursuing him if, if, if his company is still still viable. And if not, are you saying that the company, sorry, that the department has a degree of responsibility 
And as I would, would think they had placed that people on the level incorrectly and did not provide the guarantee that people need, that you could have a responsibility. Yeah. That, uh, well, if the developer is still trading, then the developer still has a responsibility and that remains the preferred course of action. And when we're reducing bonds, this is something we, we, we would look at. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm just saying if, if, the, if the fault is, if, if, the, if there's no protection for the owner or the, or the developer uh, and there's an error in bond level, I thought there is a responsibility with the department to step in. So I'm, 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 I get in the sense that's what you're saying. Um, I'm trying to think of this. Just overall, are, are the numbers of unadopted homes, uh, roads uh, with householders going up or going down? Yeah, well, the number, the number of, well, the number of live sites is going up, but they're not necessarily, you know, that's, that's new, new sites. That's, there's a number of sites in our system, you know, if you look at the table, it has increased, but that's a reflection on, on the market. Um, the, the, you know, the level of enforcement action has reduced in the last number of years, which probably reflects partly our capacity and partly the, the fact that, um, you know, things are working better, but to say the vast majority of these go through fine. It's a, it's a small number that, you know, that, uh, that caused them major difficulties. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I just want to put on the record, I have worked with um, local officials in a number of sites in, in the UE Centrum area. It, it has taken quite a time on occasions, but uh, there's been good cooperation and we, we did get the result ultimately by drawing down the bonds and uh, local services were, were, were improved and road services put in place. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Kimmins? Thank you, Chair. And a lot of what I was going to ask has been asked by the previous um, speakers. So, Connor, I've only just, I suppose, one um, question. It's just really to say, um, we talk about the, the greater understanding in terms of solicitors and, and on the importance of bonds. Um, can the bond then typically cover the, the adoption costs? Is that, is that what you're saying, or if it comes to it, or, or how does that work? Um, just, you're breaking up, up a bit there. It's certainly. Uh, so, um, could you just repeat the question? Just uh, was breaking up a bit slightly there for yeah. me. No, I was just asking in terms of um, of the bonds and and that kind of greater understanding that solicitors have on the you know in terms of the importance of bonds. Yeah. Um, can can the bond then do they actually can they cover the adoption costs if it comes to it, or, or how does that work? No, that, that's that's the plan. Is you know, right. is that we take out a bond at the start to cover the costs of of bringing a site up to um, the the proper standard, and then there's different levels of redu reduction as the scheme as it develops. And we will review at that stage. But certainly, the intent of the bond is for us to to be able to have to access funding to to complete the development of the site should the developer, for whatever reason, uh, not be able to do so. Yeah, no, that's grand. Most of the stuff I was going to ask has been asked anyway, so just a wee bit of clarity around that one, but thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, like Liz, most of my questions have already been asked and answered. Just, and um, particularly Mr. Hildish, one of the questions I wanted to ask was around staffing arrangements, because that's having a particular impact upon uh, local people. Um, I know there's a number of developments in North Down that when you meet the people, they're still living in an absolute nightmare with the streets not adopted. And um, my particular issue really is that about, are you aware of any safety issues arising from this? Because I'm aware of residents where there's real risk of falling and tripping uh, because the road has not been completed. And that is a real concern. So whether you're aware of those issues and what you're doing to address that. Yeah, well, ultimately, the safety of any site lies with um, the developer. But you know, once we get into you know considering sites for enforcement, you know, the the level of defects, the level of safety, and public health issues will all be you know given consideration when we decide what sites to 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 take forward. Um, so yeah, it is something that we consider. But you know, until such a time as it is adopted. Um, those are issues that um, developer would be responsible for and would certainly be made aware of them. Yeah, so just around that, are you, do you gather any information in relation to accidents and sort of health and safety issues arising at these developments? And would you have any statistics around that? Uh, no, we wouldn't. Um, you, you know, I would have thought that's it's not something that gets our length at all. You know, if anything happens in what's a private site, I would assume that the residents would be 
um, contacting the the developers because it's ultimately the developers have the responsibility and we wouldn't have any um, powers to do anything. So you know, it's not something I don't think would, we would be made aware aware of in in, in the day to day operation. Yeah, it's just a real concern um, around these issues, that, and there's real frustration about the department not being able to move as swift as what it should do. Do you have any information, really, for example, in terms of the oldest site, which hasn't been adopted, and the, how long this goes back to? Um, I don't have it. I'm sure we can certainly find it and come come back uh, on that and, and provide that. But I just don't have it to hand. Yeah, it'll be useful to get some statistics around the scale of this problem because I just know the local people are enduring. Um, situations which are going on for years now and are really keen to see resolutions. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome, uh, Connor. Um, Connor, just in terms of the uh, the bond itself, I mean, in, in your paper, you're saying the bonds are insufficient and you present the paper to the, the Minister. Where is that paper now and what's, what's your views on that in terms of? Proposed increases, or is there any information on this now? Well, there's, you know, I, I don't have it. The hand is currently developed. It. I, I haven't uh, um, seen it as yet. I haven't approved it. Uh, but it's something we certainly plan to take to, to the minister shortly. You know, there's obviously few sides to this because they, you know, the, the, the industry is another player here, and you know, if it's if, if there's increased bond levels, then it's increased cost of bonds, then it's increased cost to consumers and ultimately the house owner. So all these factors have to be um, considered. Uh, so where, where it will end up remains to be seen. Uh, you know, and I just don't know at this time. Um, you haven't seen the conclusions of the, the ongoing review. And, and Thomas, in, in terms of the, obviously there's an opportunity now with the, with the new uh, area development plans with council. I was working with them in terms of development, in terms of New sites in terms of how you can recover some of this because I mean clearly if there, if if Maryland service uh, is going to give permission for a site, we need to be looking at these sites. They're developed, they're paid for. Individuals are buying houses. It should be a whole package. It, and in terms of your discussions, is there not an opportunity now to address these issues um, through a new phase of planning, or are you, are you sitting outside that in terms of what what you're trying to do because? Clearly, clearly, when a developer moves in, surely he has to finish the site out. He or she, whoever the developer is, has to, to finish the site out, and that should be part of the discussions. No. Well, it's probably two uh, slightly different things. You know, the, the development plan will really be looking at what sites can be developed going forward, what sites are most suitable for development, how it fits into the the whole fabric of the town or, or, or settlement, and that's the sort of thing that's looked. At in the local development plan and certainly we offer our comments and advices on what you know what constraints there may be uh, within the in individual sites in terms of the existing road infrastructure and um, once it moves to the development stage that sort of kicks into a different territory being the, you know the private streets order and how we ensure that um, happens going forward so I think there, there's slightly different issues but Connor, surely there's an opportunity to talk about you know, if, if there's a bond going to be taken out, the, the price of that bond, the percentage or whatever it is, whatever the site is, for to ensure that the site's adopted fully at the end of the process. Yep. So, I mean, that, that should yeah. be talked yeah. but, but does the department, I mean, is in, in all of this here, I mean, I just want to ask you in terms of legacy sites, amount, is, does the department end up footing the bill in relation to this here? If the, if there's, I, I'm surprised there are some of the conversations you had with some of the questions there early on about, you know, these sites been given permission and there's no bond attached to them. I mean, it's it's amazing because I have found in my experience that there's a number of sites sit for two or three or four or five longer number of years that, that the site actually hasn't been finished. So, I mean, you know, where are we with that in terms of trying to address those problems? Yeah, well, well that's, you know, in, in terms of the ongoing work we're doing, in terms of looking at the, the level of bond, that's, um, that's work we're doing at the minute. I think it... There's a suggestion after the 2012 inquiry that, that this be the bonds be index index linked, and that was explored at the time. But um, the the lenders had trouble with that, and it, you know if that was pursued, it was going to be difficult for um, developers to get the bonds. So so that didn't uh, progress. So it, so it's really it's something that we're looking at now as part of the the bond review and, and the level, but it's not something that it's uh, of particular. 
interest to councils per se. Um, so, but, but we are looking at it from a deeper mental point of view. Would, would you agree that the the, the, the discussion should be at, as you know at an early stage as part of the process? I mean, I appreciate there's different responsibilities, but I mean, if we're if we're ever going to recover this or sort this problem out, surely you know the, the issue needs to be discussed at the start of the process as opposed to the level of development, you know, many stages. I know myself, some of the developments are in four or five phases, could could be over a five, six, seven, eight year period. I mean, that that needs to be addressed at the start of the process. But ju- just just a couple of final questions in recent. Firstly, if, if you, I know you may not be able to answer now in terms of legacy sites. Uh, can you come back in relation to the department or to the committee, sorry, in relation to the legacy sites? But see the issue of the voluntary exit scheme and was it a was it a case of it was a money issue? Um, why was there not a workforce model put in place to deliver? Because it seems to me there's a number of people, experienced people, has left the department, and how, how did that all come about? Was it was it not like when we transfer ours to local authority in terms of planning? There was a workforce model drew up to deliver that model, right? To deliver the the service. Was that not the case in terms of the voluntary exit scheme for DFA? Because, I mean, you're saying there there's a number of people get out who have lost experience and now we're having the, like, take, for instance, now the, the, the issue of the bonds. How many people were there doing that job and how many people is now doing the job? Do we lose what you say you lost over 50%? Why was there not a workforce model to deliver that service? Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's the the model that you would suggest that you should have put in place before we would need to deliver all the services we want to do. It has to align with the budget that is available. So the starting point is the budget, and then we've got to uh, develop our structures to match that. But but Connor, there's, there's no way to say, you know, you're delivering a model of the budget. I mean, surely all of us in the committee, no matter no matter what what party we're in, if if it's a case, it's about delivering the service as opposed to the issue of the budget. I mean, if, if you had to come, I mean, I, I can't understand how we would have cut staff by 50% and let them out the door. And now we're sitting here and we're not able to deliver services. It's about, it's about a public service and delivering the service. That's so clearly there wasn't yeah. a workforce model. It was a budget issue. Yeah. 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 We'll start with the budget and, uh, and then we've got to, to develop our structures to suit, you know, you know, and I think given the number of bonds in place, um, you know, you know, I think the, the teams we have in place, you know, do cover the vast majority of this. As I say, it works very well. There is a small number of sites that that, that need a bit more attention, and I think that's always going to be the case. Uh, you, you know, but uh, you know where we are, where we are in terms of resource and um, and staffing levels, and you can't. Increase staffing levels without um, um, in, in increasing having an impact on your resource budget. You know, and that applies not only to the private space function, but that's across a whole range of functions. No, no, I appreciate it, and, and it's not. I, I understand. I have a good working relationship with the with the people here, and I mean they're doing they're doing as best a job as they can within the budgets. The point is then. Final question is in terms of the bonds itself, in terms of this service, uh, how, how many of the staff have you lost? I mean, it, did you say fifty percent has been lost? In terms of delivery, well, in, in terms of, in terms of yeah, bonds. it's fifty percent of the yeah, it's fifty percent of the, the whole team. But you know, bonds isn't uh, you know it's, it's part of a, the yeah, entire yeah. process, which includes the, the whole planning process and the supervision and the, the adoption. So you know, that's that's one part of it. You know, so it's uh, you, I couldn't isolate the figure in relation to bonds alone. No, no, fair enough. And finally, just uh, thanks, for, thanks for your indulgence, sir. The the final point would be Connor. Surely there's an opportunity now and, and as we move forward in terms of new developments. And I know there's legacy sites there and I hope you're right back to, to where we are in terms of legacy sites and who's responsible and what the department will have to pay for those. Um, in terms of moving forward, there should be broader discussions with the likes of planning and service and everything else so that when there's a new site, that there's proper bonds and proper percentage of bonds and accountability is, is put in place now that those discussions need to be have, have had now. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, exactly what the exercise we're doing in relation to the bond review is. You know, and it's, it's purely a matter for the department, you know, rather than councils, uh, and it's something that we're we're actively looking at. Appreciate. It. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson.
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, I think that last comment about the, the bonds review um, is something that we all wanted to hear because in my own um, constituency in this district, there's 222 on adopted roads and worth a value of 12.5 million. But when you consider across the north, um, there's 2,991 on adopted roads worth over 101 and a half million in bonds. So I'm quite alarmed, and I say this as someone who went from 2007 raising this issue um, with regards to an estate in the waterside, uh, Woodland, the Woodland estate say it's Woodland Face, Woodland Muse, Woodland Heights now, but, um, you know, at that time, as you say, people bought their homes in good confidence. They believed that they weren't going to have sewage problems on adopted roads. And when I returned as an MLA a year ago, the same situation um, had been pertaining as what was in 2007 and it hadn't been fixed. And, you know, it took nearly bringing people together because they were ping ponging on and off one another. So to be honest with you, you know, for those um, householders who have rented or purchased um, houses in those estates and then to be left in some places in Derry where they can't even get their bins emptied. Um, so this review is part of the review. One of the, one of the issues that you mentioned um, was in relation to where developers seem to be progressing work, that your officials were working closely with them and encouraging them uh, to complete the uh, the developments in a timely manner. So I'm just giving you that time frame, um, albeit it might be slower than uh, what residents would like and tell you it was diabolical. So what's a timely manner when it is cutting, you know, when's the cutoff point for a department? Is that something that you are now reviewing, giving that one example that I've just given you and you could give you many others. There's a, there's a road in Derry that hasn't been adopted for 50 years. So how long uh, is, what, what's the time frame? is a timely manner for, for us as MLAs uh, to be able to be scrutinizing and assessing this and working with your department and others and the developers, of course, put them under pressure where we can to complete these sites to the standard that the residents moving into them, not just expect, but to serve. Yeah, yeah. It's the the review is carried out at the time in terms of what a backlog site was, and it, it related to occupancy rather than than timing. So it's um it's so when sites got to eighty percent occupancy, then they could be considered for enforcement. Yeah, and I think in relation to Woodland Close, I, you know, so I think you were talking to the officials in, in the division about that and, and yeah. received an update. Um, the site that's uh, 50 years or more, I would be interested to know where that is, uh, you know, and whether it's subject to a private street determination or whether it's one of those ones that I mentioned that wouldn't be part of the private streets process. And there are a number of those out there and there for which there are no agreements or, or, or bonds. Well, look, I, I can I can get you that that information. I had been down at at the um, around the Skeg Road, and they actually they had lights and everything else at one time on it, and then they realised it wasn't adopted and came and took the lighting um, away from 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 that particular area um, because they discovered it wasn't adopted instead of leaving the lights as they were. So that's the kind of things that people are working with. But I have to say, I'm still not I'm not understanding what a timely manner is. I think, Chair, that a timely manner needs to be defined. Now, are you, are you looking at that in this bond review? Because we need to be able to say to people um, who are buying in full confidence and good faith homes or purchasing homes or renting homes in the States that these services will be provided by, you know, a year, um, for instance, within the year of the developer leaving the site, only throw that out, it should be six months, it shouldn't even happen at all, um, that these residents will have their sewage uh, repaired or fixed are up to the standard that they deserve, that they will have the roads adopted, that their bins will be emptied, that the services that they need in that estate will be provided. So I'm not so sure that I get what you said, sorry, in relation to the timely manner. 
Yeah, you see, the, the difficulty is that it's, you know, and if we put ourselves in the developer's shoes, it depends on the rate of sale of houses, you know, because a slow moving site, as we had in the recession, um, the developer's not going to want to give any commitment or give any commitment when he only has a small number, a small percentage of houses sold within a development. You know, there are obviously cash flow issues for, for, for developers, and that's why the 80% does seem to be a, a reasonable balance looking at it from the developer side and the, the, the property owner side. So we will accept the developer will go into an estate, put in substandard services there um, because of cash flow issues and will only de deliver the services that the people who purchase these homes are going to rent these homes and deserve when it's 80% uh, occupancy. Other than that, um, they can get away with providing substandard work and that's going to be acknowledged and accepted because of cash flow issues by the department? Yeah, well, I wouldn't necessarily say it's substandard. It's, it's incomplete work. So typically, you know, when you look at development, it'll be incomplete roads, roads, you know, depending on the level of development within a site. You know, um, developers aren't going to want to be putting in roads and then having to dig them up again, you know, to put in services to the next phase of houses. So, you know, say, so looking at it practically, they, they will take it so far and maybe put in a base course. And a lot of the sites that are that he, you know, they just need a wearing course, um, you know, before they're completed. And that's, you know, I can see the sense in that because they don't want to be, as they put in a wearing course and then digging back through it again to, to link developments and, uh, and provide services. Well, see, with all due respect to you, I think the fine smell in a home for 10 years um, from sewage um, deployment of, um, of the, the sewage system <laughs> that wasn't uh, adequate um, is substandard for people to have yeah. such foul smells. Now, even today, and we're not talking about putting on surface and we're talking about potholes here. Uh, we're talking about roads being left uh, in a state that is actually any observer, any partial observer with an eye in their head to go and look at it uh, wouldn't say, well, that's just only being done to that level of and that standard and it will be improved. You know, so it's definitely, I can tell you that the ones that I have been dealing with um, can be confidently categorized as substandard work. And I don't think the department should actually accept that. Yeah, we're obviously happy to look at any individual sites. Obviously, I'm only commenting from a roadside, you know, if, uh, if the, the Northern Ireland water infrastructure, you know, there are separate bonds for those, um, you know, so uh, I, I wouldn't be aware of uh, detail in relation and any specific sites, obviously we can we can find out if sites are identified, but I just wouldn't be aware of. Well, I think, I think therein lies the problem when you have 2,991 roads unadopted and you have sewage problems as well. Um, it shouldn't be just assumed that the, de the developers have actually done this up to an adequate standard because all you have to do is listen to residents, knock at their doors, listen to their concerns, and you realise when we're having to deal with not just yourself, of DFI roads, but also with NA Water, deal with the developers, bringing everyone round the table. And developers then moving from that site and redeveloping another part of the site when that's not complete. We need to be looking at what kind of enforcement is in place and, and picking up, I think, on what Catherine was saying, because when I read what you said about the voluntary exit scheme, and one of the things that you said in the report was that the private street inspectors uh, were not um, there and available in the, in the number um, around the workforce plan that would be required for them to be um, to be inspecting and as they need to be because of the voluntary exit scheme. My understanding was that the voluntary exit scheme should not have been taken forward in that way and if it was going to impact and have an adverse impact on, for instance, here we are seeing the private street inspectors have been impacted because there are not enough of them now because of the voluntary exit scheme. Yeah, but but the the issues around the timing of completion of developments isn't impacted by the department staff in levels. It's it relates more to the intent and plans of a developer rather than the department. And, you know, that's obviously from, from their point of view, when they're looking at cash flow, when they're looking at um, nuggetary work 
and things like that. You know, it's you know they need a master plan for their entire site, and, uh, and we have to consider what is reasonable for that. Surely, a master plan for a site should be um, in at the beginning of a process when a developer is proposing to do whatever it would be. For instance, if it's a house in the state or whatever, and um, that there would have to be a guarantee that you would have the water, any water, uh, working with the developer and as has been done, and that the developer will deliver the kind of sewage system that will allow any water to pass so that the roads can be completed. Some of these roads are not able to be adopted because the work that needs done underneath the road is preventing them from fixing the road because they're going to have to come along and dig it up because of the problem with the sewage. So surely, you know, I, to be honest, um, I, I fear that maybe there might be um, a few in the department in relation to cash flow of developers. If the, ca- if the developers don't have the cash to deliver the sites, that many people are ending up with mortgages, uh, big mortgages taking on massive debts for homes that they want in confidence. Uh, to move into maybe their first home or somewhere where they want to live and they are doing that and they're excited about doing so and then they end up with a sewage problem, sewage system, foul smells. That's what I'm dealing with here in my constituency and I'm not the only MLA dealing with those issues. Yeah. No, no, certainly we have every sympathy with, it, with any um, property owner that finds himself in that situation. I have been it in myself in terms of moving into a development that took time to get for the works to, to get carried out. Um, you know, so I, I, I get that fully. So it's, it's down to, you know, the extent of the problems and what it takes to, you know, to address them. Um, you know, it certainly shouldn't be in a situation if, if there's, if it's foul smelling within property. So that tells me that's it's that something wasn't constructed properly as opposed to being incomplete and i think that's a, 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 a different a different issue but to say without individual examples i would need to discuss any of those with with northern ireland water i just you know i just need to understand individual site needs better before i could comment on well i would recommend chair that from this hearing today that the department should realize houston we have a problem We have 2,991 unadapted roads. We have over 101 million in road bonds. And we have developers moving from one site to another, leaving those sites in substandard conditions, not just roads, but sewage systems underneath. So underneath those roads that need, uh, that they need to come back and repair. So I would recommend that from what you're hearing today from the MLAs, and we can all provide evidence, and I'm sure it wouldn't just be in our committee if that's what's required, but an investigation into this by the department would, I think, result in the need for some kind of robust action to be put in place uh, in a legislative uh, footing uh, so that uh, these developers are held to account. And it's not just with bonds, but that they don't get, in my opinion, they should not be allowed to move to another site within you know, a period of time, a reasonable period of time. And that's why I was asking about a timely fashion. Um, before they move to another site, they need to complete the site that they, in good faith, uh, were granted permission in the first instance. So thank you, Chair, but I think we have a lot of work to do in the committee to take us further. Okay, thank you. And at least a little bit of my thunder in regards to some summation of this, but um, I'll move on to um, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you. Thanks, Connor Lane. I appreciate a lot of stuff has been covered. Just a quick question, uh, Connor, regarding guidance. So, for developers building, for example, 10 homes, 20 homes, or 100 homes, I presume there's a different bond process for each of those, depending on the size of the state or depending on the obviously kilometres of the size of the roads. Is all those different parts of that guidance insufficient financially? So assuming then, whenever you give um, the green light to a developer to, and you got a bond, are, you, are we now saying that all of it is insufficient to finish the road work if the developer burst? 
Uh, uh, no, the the purpose of the bond would be, you know, it, it should be sufficient to to meet the to meet the the, any, the whatever outstanding works need to be done. The bond should cover that. Um, how a bond is packaged is supposed to depend on the developers' individual needs, and we've noticed that sort of moving towards smaller bonds. I remember in in days gone by, they would sort of bond the entire site, um, but they've sort of maybe moved to smaller packages now and doing you know a number of streets within a development and bonding that and 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 getting that work done and those houses sold and the money in and doing the works in those and getting those adopted. You know, this so they've certainly moved towards. Um, uh, smaller bonded areas but you know but the process is still the same i can just come through the, the figure that we talked about you know the three thousand odd bonds in place you know that you know they're not that's all live bonds and that includes bonds that have just been taken out of new developments so that's not backlog sites that's that's the total number of developments or bonds that the department has in place you know for, for sites of, of, of all ages in your opinion Connor, is there issues Sorry, you're breaking up there. In your opinion, own process of Remember to comment your opinion. Sorry, Keith, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. So Connor, in your opinion, is there issues within own own process? Sorry, Keith. Whenever you turn away from the mic, we can't hear you. So could you, could you can come you hear me now? Then? We can hear you when you speak into the mic. Okay, I'll try. And... Hey, Connor, are you then agreeing that this bond process is that something you're committed to address? Yeah, I, I think I'm getting your question. Is, is that, do I think it's that uh, and the, the process is working at the minute broadly? Sorry, Keith, we can't hear you. I am still. Hear me now, no? Yes. Don't worry. Well, just, 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 there's an echo in the background, Keith. Yeah. Okay, I'll try one more time. Um, That's better. That's better. Are you basically content to agree, Connor, that there's issues with the whole bond process? And you've heard Martina's points, you've heard Cal, you've heard all the members' points. Are you agreeing that there's your issue with the whole bond process and finishing of unadapted roads in areas? Are you agreeing and understanding the big issue? Uh, you no, know, not necessarily, because you know there was a review carried out in 2012, and you know. Uh, and as I've said earlier, the vast majority of sites progress, progress as per the normal process, you know, and there's a lot of excellent work done by staff and developers and elected representatives and property owners to make sure that the vast majority of these go through as planned. Yes, there is a small number that um, could be better, but you have to remember that it's, it's, you know, this is a developer-led process. Um, you know, so the department's role is, 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 is quite restricted and, and limited. Ultimately, it is the dispenser, the developers that are responsible for the timing and programming of sites. Yes, but obviously, obviously, Connor, the, the, the developer can then move on and, and, as Martina has said, leave the mess behind for ultimately the people living in that area to, to try and live with, which is obviously unfair. So, obviously, I think the thing needs to be tighter and appreciate the review will cover that. Final question, Chair of May. Just on the table, um, Connor, you know, this, the bonds in place is up by 25% from 2013-14, but the enforce, enforcement action is down by 80%. I appreciate the two may or not obviously be linked, but what, what would you say to that, them figures, based on an increase of 25, but a reduction in 80% in, in enforcement? Why would you say that's the case? Yeah, but, yeah, because the fact that the number of bonds in place is increasing is, is a, to me, a reflection in the market. You, you know that the, you know we're we're post recession and the housing market is is has got better, and the better it gets, the more bonds that will be in place, the more activity there is in the housing market, and it's uh, the more resource it requires from our side to manage that. I suppose, you know, the the more recent enforcement action figures, you know, the fact they've reduced from, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 down would be a reflection 
and our um, reduction in staff available for work of this nature and the need for those staff to be working on what is a busier market on, on live sites that you know that are uh, working properly it's so a combination working. of a couple of things yeah the, the enforcement action numbers reducing does not say the problem's going away. It's saying there's not staff to solve the problem. Um, yeah, no, no, definitely not saying that, that the, the problem is going away. It's it's there's less of them because staff are more focused on 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 trying to get sites resolved without the need for enforcement, which is the preferred course of action. Okay, thank you, Connor. Thank you, Chair. And apologies for my technical issues. Trying. Well, you you sort you sorted them all right. Okay. Well, I don't know how I did it, but anyway. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, and, and thank you, um, Connor and um, and Lionel. He didn't really have very much to say in that session, but thank you very much for attending this morning. And as you will, um, you'll gather, um, members do have concerns with regards to this, and we will be returning to it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Just, just in, with regards to what you, you've heard, um, I'm not sure that I was very convinced or indeed satisfied um, with um, the responses to those questions, and I have concerns with regards to perhaps the seriousness with which this has really been um, taken, um, with little regard probably for for the um, report of the previous committee um, in relation to it. I suppose there are, there are two avenues in this, in that we write to the Minister outlining the concerns which have been raised, um, or we go to, um, we ask staff to look at a committee motion to be drafted. Um, we can do both, or we can go directly to a committee motion. Um, it's really, I'll be led by, by members with regards to that, because I do think this is a concern, and um, this isn't political. <laughs> this is an issue which is um, being experienced by um, members across all their constituencies. This is a, an ongoing issue, which has been in place for quite a considerable number of years. Um, and it's just about trying to, to focus minds to look to um, a resolution. So I'm content to take views from members. Um, Ms. Anderson. Um, Chair, I think you, you have a measure of what we all heard. And um, when you consider that a previous committee carried out an extensive inquiry, and I only give that example of an area, one area of my own constituency in the Waterside and Derry, and I'm sure every MLA could give other examples of what's happened in their area. And that's from 2007, when I was first elected, and only getting it resolved now when I returned. So uh, I have to say, Chair, I think what you said about writing to the Minister, yes. Um, I'm sure she must be dealing with something similar in her own constituencies, because this you can't have 2,991 unadapted roads uh, with over 101 million on road bonds. Uh, it's affecting many, if not every area um, across the north. But I do believe a motion would bring it to public attention. People out there need to hear that we're not satisfied with um, business as usual uh, continuing on this and this issue of the cash flow issues for developers. I felt from what was said to us today that that seems to be um, being put in front of the needs of uh, those people who are living in the States. And I think they need to hear us coming together. And like you said, I think it is one of those issues that there's common ground across the chamber there will be. And I believe there will be cross uh, party support. Uh, for a motion calling for more robust implementation of enforcement than what has currently taken place to date. Okay, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was actually, I think, on the original, as I said before, committee that uh, did the inquiry, and it is. Um, uh, alarming to see that while some progress has been made, there's still many areas um, that have yet to be adopted. Uh, there was just one point um, that I had wanted to make was um, given that you have building control inspectors, you have planning inspectors around uh, looking at the, the development of the houses for sign off. 
I just wondered, is there another way in which we could be asking for cross-departmental work? It's a bit like, you know, what people used to say about the farms, all these different inspectors coming out and, and duplication uh, of uh, work for uh, the farmers, etc. I just wonder, is there a better way for departments to work together uh, if there are shortages? And I know that planning also has shortage. Uh, and I wonder if, if we are doing a committee motion, uh, could some of that uh, be teased out in the debate? Um, Mr. Muir? Yeah, I think a committee motion would be important. I wasn't really entirely satisfied with some of the responses we got this morning, and this is a key issue. So I think a committee motion would be important to give the issue a proper airing and also to put pressure on the department to address this, because I think if we don't do that, this will just rumble on for years more. Okay. Mr. Beggs? Hello. Um, I, I agree a motion could, could be useful. We will have to recognise one of the key points that was made here was that there were not sufficient staff and sufficient budget in the department to enable this to happen. The other aspect, I agree with um, uh, Member Dolores Kelly, that there could well be better uh, linking up with other sections of government. Um, and in particular, I'm aware, for instance, you can't even pour your foundations without a building control uh, involvement. So I would have thought it may well be possible if a developer is behind in his obligations in one part of the scheme to put blockages that, that would prevent others also falling into such situations. So, so if a developer uh, cannot carry out his responsibilities, it's better that comes to a head sooner rather than continue to adversely affect not only the current residents but future residents that he intends to sell the sites to. So I think there's much merit in, 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 a, in a such a motion. Okay, thank you. Um, if so, if you're content, I'll um, ask um, my colleagues here in, who are supporting us in the committee to, um, to look at uh, drafting something which will encapsulate the concerns which members have expressed and to bring it to next week for our deliberation, if you're content to do that. I don't really want to get into a situation where we're firing motions back and forward around everyone. I think it's much easier if we have a, a discussion around it, if you're content to do that at next week's meeting. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think... The, uh, Sure. Our concerns will be reflected to the minister. I'm guessing from those who are listening in. Um, but uh, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, chair. Just one one final point. Chair, it's vitally important as part of the motion. I mean, clearly, when the VES scheme was conducted in 2014, 15, it's a number of years ago now. There was no workforce model in place. It was about budgets, and that that needs to be reflected as part of our conversation on the day. I just want to remind members about that because there's no way that, that the service, and Martina alluded to it earlier on herself, I mean, there's no way that this service was going to be delivered if they cut this, you know, the, the, uh, the department in half in relation to it. I mean, so that's, that's got to be reflected in the motion as well. And I, don't, and I don't disagree with you, but I think we also have to have, with, I suppose, caution in relation to that as well, because... A lot of this is really around the onus on the developer, and it's about the, um, I suppose, the regulations and so on that are put in place in order to manage that. Um, and I think that was reflected in, in, while it's in our paper. I think Connor did state, while that's an issue, it's probably not the main issue for this. So I'm, I'd be, I would be cautious that we become distracted around that um, as well. But I think certainly it, it's it's something which needs to be looked at in the broader terms with regards to, to, to workforce. Um, Mr. Beggs? Yeah, um, just, I, I agree with what the, the Chair is saying there. And it would be important that we would mention solicitors in any such motion because they have uh, a due diligence responsibility um, and actually have a legal responsibility if they fail to carry that out and can be sued. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, members content, then we'll move on to our. Our next briefing, um, which is in relation to the A5 and the York Street interchange. And again, Hansard will record the meeting. Our briefing note is at page 93. And we'll welcome via Starleaf um, John Irvine, who is the Director of Major Projects and Procurement, Colin Sykes, the Network Development and SRI uh, man Manager, mm -hmm. and um, Seamus Key, 
Keenan, PPTO civil engineer um, SRI team. Um, you're all very welcome. That was all a bit of a mouthful, but you're all very welcome. So thank you very much for, for attending um, this morning. And if I can defer then to, to John to, um, to take the lead, and then um, we'll move forward then with questions after that. Thank you. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, Seamus will deal with the A5 issues and, and Colin with York Street Interchange. So um, uh, we've given you a detailed uh, paper uh, setting out the, the timelines for, for both of the schemes, so some background information there. Uh, and just briefly, uh, to set the scene, you know, the, the current position with the A5 uh, uh, was set out by the Minister in a, an announcement on the 16th of March, uh, when she um, uh, published the uh, interim departmental statement and set out the next steps for the scheme. Um, <clears throat> on, on York Street, um, uh, the, the, the timeline for the scheme has been set out. Essentially, it has been through all the statutory processes. Um, there was an issue with the procurement challenge uh, that that required the um, uh, the procurement process to be halted in 2019, um, and then uh, so that was in the time of the absence of ministers. Um, uh, when we got to July 2020, the minister uh, requested an independent assurance review of the scheme. Um, that review was conducted and uh, it, uh, came up with a number of recommendations, which are set out in the paper. So, so that's you know, there, there's uh, background information there, and um, probably best if we if if you'd like just to go straight to questions. Our time. So my questions will be brief because obviously we have um, looked at this on a, on a number of occasions, um, be it um, with regards to programme for government and budget and so on as well. Um, but obviously the, the, the main concern around the A5 is obviously the, the delays and the lack of progress and the considerable amount of costs which have now been allocated against the project without you know a sod having been dug um, in respect of it. And I suppose it's really about um, sort of other considerations regarding that route, um, and whether, um, sort of, given the time lapse, whether any sort of serious consideration now is being given at looking at that scheme in maybe much smaller sections. And, and I know that it was to be a phased scheme anyway, but I mean, we're all aware of there are certain parts of the of that road which are are, are quite dangerous, um, and perhaps may be easier to address. Um, and I suppose really it's, it's just that sort of broader thinking that um, I suppose I want to probe with you as to whether that's being looked at. So maybe Seamus, if you'd like to comment on that. Sorry, on mute. Um, yeah, the, the commissioner did, you, you might be aware, uh, took the view that there was an obligation on, on the department and its role as the statute decision maker to consider alternatives to the proposed scheme and therefore a need to look at matters to just the extent to which town bypasses and other selected improvements would meet the overall aims and objectives of the dual carriageway scheme and look at that assessment and the impact of those alternatives and their environmental impacts in particular. Uh, so that's something the department is currently doing and carrying out that study and that will be presented uh, along with the environmental statement addendum, hopefully later this year, for consultation. Okay, so that's really only being looked at now. That wasn't, sort of, because I'm conscious of this has been going on for, what, in excess of 14 years. Um, so that, that work is only now really being carried out as a consequence of the, of the report? Essentially, yes. Um, the... the Remit for the scheme was always to provide a dual carriage, uh, and that's what the department has stuck to over the years. Okay, and, and obviously, the report was very was quite critical of of the department. Um, so, so what, what actions are you taking in order to try to sort of to mitigate against some of the criticisms that were have been have been put to you? Um, well, yes, we've had meetings with our senior council on this, and. Uh, we're addressing all the issues raised by the Commissioner 
uh, including his 30 recommendations. And we will be addressing as far as ever possible all those issues within the new environmental statement addendum. Okay, and um, just just to re just remind me again, when when, are, when is that likely to be um, submitted? It's currently scheduled for the autumn uh, for public consultation at that time. At that time. And the programme would lead on from there towards a reconvene public inquiry, as recommended by the commissioner, uh, at some point early to mid 2022. Okay, and and that and will that be for the whole scheme, or is that again looking at this this sort of. Um sort of smaller section approach as well? It'll be looking at the scheme in its entirety and all aspects of it and all those issues uh, raised by the by the PEC and particularly the two key recommendations around alternatives and flood risk assessment. Okay, so we're still some, some considerable time off actually seeing this progressed to actually happening? Yeah, that, that was a fair one. Uh, this, we could get to construction on site in 2023. Um, yeah, that's subject to clearing all the necessary statutory processes and indeed the environmental assessments as well. So, yes, there's, there's still quite a bit of work to do. Right. Okay. Um, just with regards to um, the, the York Street interchange um, project, and, and I appreciate that the um, the minister has accepted the six recommendations. Um, and that was set out on the 26th of March, and the, a report will come back to her in autumn 2021. Um, what will happen after that date, um, and what's the likely time scale for progressing that scheme after then? So maybe I'll come in on that one. Um, uh, so the Minister has asked us to do some further work, and, and that work has kicked off, and as you said, that will report in the autumn. Um, so we'll present that to the minister, and then the minister will have to decide uh, uh, how she wants to take this forward, uh, and, and you know what what time frame. As I said, I think at a previous committee, we, 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 the scheme has essentially uh, been through the, the statutory processes, and it is uh, uh, procurement ready. Um, uh, but the, the minister, you know, uh, asked for this short, sharp review. Just to make sure that the scheme aligned with her kind of wider sort of place making active travel objectives, and we're, and we're doing that. So when we, when we present that to the minister in the autumn, then she will have to make a call on on, on what to do next. Okay, and, and by obviously looking at that, will that is that likely to mean quite fundamental changes in the scheme, which will then make a trigger for having to go through a number of these stages again? Well, it, it obviously depends on, on on what the outcome of this is. Uh, you know, if there are any significant changes, yes, you're correct. Um, uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. You know, part of the review is is it's looking at kind of a, a much wider area, and you know, uh, uh, I, I suppose um, you know, looking at um, uh, the York Street scheme and, and beyond the areas like Clifton Gateway, Dunbar Link, you know, looking at the wider cycle network and permeability through the site, how it links to the, the bolder vision for Belfast, so uh, and, and all the various policies that that ha have emerged, you know, over the last, you know, since the scheme started uh, its evolution in 20, 2008. and you know, uh, I suppose the the policy agenda has. Has moved on. You have the Boulder Vision. You have the Belfast Agenda. The Minister's Green Blue Infrastructure. So, essentially, this is a look over the shoulder at the scheme to see how it aligns with those wider policies. And you know, when that's completed, uh, we'll end up with a sort of a place-making and active travel report that the Minister will then consider. Now, uh, you know, that, that, that could end up with uh, uh, you know the scheme as is, but with uh, maybe recommendations for. How you improve the, the uh, environment around it? Uh, you know, at, at the committee, I think it was the twenty-first of April. The minister said she wants to maximise the ambition of what can be delivered. Um, you know, around connectivity and the living places agenda. So that, that that's the thrust of what we're doing. We've kicked that off. Um, we'll have to wait the outcome to see what, what, if any, impact it would have on the actual scheme. And, and I absolutely appreciate that, and I, I made the comment to the minister. But in, with regards to that, but I suppose it's about it being delivered is really the the issue in all of these things. Because I mean, 
you know, a lot of these schemes are announced with great fanfare, um, and then we get sort of many years later and lots of grey hairs later and maybe less hair later, um, and they still haven't been haven't been delivered. Um, and you know, there's an expectation that is raised, and, and a lot of these things are, are then become sort of more aspirational um, than reality. Yeah. So, so ultimately, that's a decision for the minister. Um, uh, I suppose also, uh, uh, the ultimately, delivery indeed depends on on the, on the future availability of funding. But that, that's something the minister will have to take into account. She asked us to do this review, uh, and we'll present it to her in the autumn, and then she'll she'll have to come to a decision on that. Yeah, and, and absolutely, and I would be supportive of of that. Um, but also mindful, of, you know, how that's going to maybe then impact upon um, sort of overall delivery and, and, and the time scales for that to obviously subject to all the things that you've said with regards to funding. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Hilditch. Thanks Chair and just following on from yourself, obviously the uh, York Street interchange has been on the go since about 2007, we're 14 years down the road. Now the project which uh, the review of the project that was completed in November 20, though it took another five months in for the Minister to accept the six recommendations, the purpose of that review was to determine the scheme's ability to deliver against the Minister's priorities of well-being, sustainable travel, creating thriving livable spaces and communities to ensure it is aligned with emerging policy. Now, what in 2020? What he's looking at now, on top of that, in 21, because that sort of embodies everything that you've just explained, which appears to have been already looked at in November 20. So, so if I could just come to that, so the the, the review, so the minister asked us uh, uh, to to do a short sharp review, um, uh, to deal with those priorities, her priorities. Uh, of well-being, sustainable travel, and living places. So the review was done, and the outcome of that review gives us six recommendations, and we're now taking that forward. So essentially, what we're doing is ex- the minister has accepted the recommendations of the review, and she's asked us to do a little more work on that. She's asked for. Sorry, right. She accepted the six recommendations. So did we just not move on since we covered all that sort of stuff? Okay. So the, the, done that. so the, the, the recommendations are suggesting further work. Um, that's what the minister's asked us to do. So that's the sh- that's a commission uh, that is now underway to look at this and report in the autumn, and then to allow the minister then to make a decision on the next steps. Okay, I appreciate your stop for time, Chair. Can I give my point? Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Boylan. Okay, Chair. Sure. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Just a few quick questions, Chair. Um, in, in relation to one of the um, recommendations in the placemaking and the new best practice in terms of urban transport design, I mean, can you expand a wee bit on that, John? And John, also, I noticed the. Um, it's, it seems to me I was down on the ground looking at the, at the scheme, and, and I've nothing per se against the actual scheme itself. But what I would say is, in my personal view. North Belfast seems to be detached from the city centre itself, obviously because of, because of the West Link and everything else. So, I mean, I would like to think that after the scheme that there will be better opportunities to connect that end of the city to the city centre and more opportunities for, the, for those people who live there. So in that context, one, just about the placemaking issue, just to expand a wee bit, and also in terms of, you said, there needs to be much more uh, closer coordination between DFA and the interested parties. I mean, does that include the, the uh, community groups there and uh, different sections of the community within North Belfast, yeah? Yeah, so Colin, you can maybe come in here as well, but part of the review uh, is to engage with stakeholders, both internal, departmental, cross-departmental, and with external stakeholders, so that would be uh, uh, communities and organisations, so, so that, that, that has been taken forward. Um, um, you know, what is the living places agenda? Uh, you know, it's it's about creating a sense of place and connectivity. I, I, I suppose, you know, schemes can be very hard engineered, uh, and it's a question, I suppose, of, of how you can soften that, uh, how you can ensure there's connectivity uh, through the site, and, uh, and, and uh, 
you, you mentioned North Belfast being disconnected. Uh, you know, th th this review is, is looking at a sphere of influence that goes much beyond the scheme to, to see how you know those things all come together and whether there's there's anything else that can be done uh, you know to improve the kind of connectivity uh, of the whole area and um, you know link link to the direction of travel with with what is the set boulder vision of, for Belfast which is it's all about city center and you know, connectivity um, Colin, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yes, I would just sort of say, just in terms of sort of place making and sort of active travel analysis, you know, the as part of this this commission, you know, the the consultant will be looking at spatial analysis and you know, which includes um, the the surrounding area, you know, the the origin and destination that you know that people have and and the connectivity both through and and around the scheme itself. Uh, equally. On the stakeholder engagement side, that you know there there will be, as John said, uh, further stakeholder engagement, both internally and externally, and you know, and that that will very much sort of concentrate on the needs and the aspirations, and, and equally the the opportunities that that are potentially available that would allow the yeah allow the scheme to have a, a better strategic fit with with all those emerging policies that are coming out. No, I appreciate that. Both the responses are. I just hope that. There's good opportunities for that for those people at the end of the city. To be honest, I mean, but but I think um, I'm in support of, of, of the project itself. Just one final question in terms of the F five, John. Um, say in terms of the monies from the southern government, are they still committed in terms of that project and the F five, or can you speak on that, please? So a new decade, new approach. Uh, the Irish government, uh, I think, set out its commitment uh, to phase one A of of the scheme. Uh, so th th I think that commitment is still there. Um, yeah, is that fair enough, James? There's nothing really to add to that. Yeah, yeah, that was committed under the Stormont Agreement in 2015, and yes, was reconfirmed then to new decade, new approach. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the officials for coming along today. Just conscious of time. So, um, in relation to the A5, um, you are very acutely aware of what the uh, approval process is in place that needs uh, environmental assessments to be up to date. Is there not a risk that if we and make it clear that I support and the party supports the progression of the A5 scheme, but is there not a risk that if we don't break down this scheme into more manageable chunks, that we'll be in the same situation we are today? Uh, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years' time, whereby the scheme will not progress? And is that not a real serious concern? The one point I would make in that is that regardless if you break the scheme down into manageable chunks or not, you still have to do the environmental assessments for the whole scheme. You can't look just in isolation at individual sections environmentally. Uh, so you'd still have those same issues arising from an environment point of view, regardless of which approach you took. Okay. So we're sitting here today in 2021, and you're obviously outlined in timescales. How realistic do you feel that the timescales you've outlined to us today are achievable? Because one of the massive issues we have here in Northern Ireland is about the delivery of capital projects on time. And I really do greatly appreciate the work that you do in relation to all of this, because uh, you really do, do go above and beyond. But is there not a real risk that the timescales of this um, are really – we can't give any assurances to people in terms of when we're actually going to start to see work on the ground? I think I think and you can come in after. Um, I think the key issue here is we're we're in the statutory processes and we have to complete the statutory processes. Um, we're focused on uh, uh, on making sure that you know is is delivered and you know we have a team of experts and we we engage very closely with senior council to make sure we 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 get get through that. But you know major projects and, and particularly one of this. Size, they're, they are, they're very complex and you know carry a lot of environmental risks, um, uh, and we just have to work away. We have to get to the end of the process. Uh, uh, same as them, more to add. 
Yeah, the only thing I would add, John, uh, it's just that we have our council, senior council on board, which we probably hadn't got previously, and he's advising us all the way. So we're doing our absolute best to try and tick all the boxes and get through the processes as best and as quickly we can. Um, thank you for that. I think it just put clearly on the record, I do appreciate the work being done, but I have real concerns if we continue with the current strategy, not one ounce of tarmac will be poured and that will be a real failure for the people in the West. And I think we do need to evaluate how we're going forward in relation to this to ensure that we actually get delivery, which is what people want. In relation to the York Street interchange, I understand and fully support the need for a reappraisal of the design, particularly in terms of the active travel, walking and cycling from what is York Gate Station through to the new University of Ulster. Um, the, the previous design was, wasn't conducive to that, and I think there's a need to do that. The issue for me is that what are the exact timescales for then if there has to be design changes to get those design changes finalised? to get the approvals and then the procurement. How long are we talking if there is changes to ensure that there is better, better active travel routes linking North Belfast with the city centre to get this scheme on the ground? So maybe just to take that point, so we'll, we'll have to wait the outcome of the review uh, to see what it, it comes up with uh, and then what the minister, uh, uh, how she wishes to proceed. And then at that point in time, uh, you know, if there were changes to be made, we'd have to figure out what needed to be done, uh, how long it would take, and, and the point uh, I think was raised earlier, if that was significant enough to require us to, uh, to do something with regard to the, the statutory procedures. So it, 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 we, we, we certainly will have to wait and see. It, it's one of the areas, the, so the, the permeability of the site, the co connectivity through the site is one of the things that, that uh, we're looking at. Uh, and it may be that, that that can be enhanced without actually impacting on on the the the, the, the if you like the envelope for the scheme. Colin, anything more to that? Um, no, John. I think that you're right. That's um, I think the key point is that the the act of travel review is a uh, is an essential component of this this work that is going ahead. Um, and, but certainly, it, it, it will be looking at opportunities both within within the sort of footprint of the scheme itself, but equally um, those opportunities that may be delivered out with the, the scheme as well. But uh, absolutely, it's it's very it's very difficult to tell at this stage um, what what impact that we uh, those proposals may have on the delivery of the scheme going forward. Just, just one last final question, because I'm conscious of time. If you had to redo the statutory procedures, how long would that take, and how long would the procurement process take as a rough guide? Well, I think it would depend. So we're not at that stage yet, so that's probably not good to speculate. It would depend on if there was anything significant come out of this, we'd have to examine that and then look at that. But uh, we're not at that stage yet, and uh, I think it's better to wait and see what the outcome of this is. Um, uh, and then, w once a decision is made uh, after that, then uh, the, the procurement time. The, so the way this was set up before was it was a two, two stage procurement where you would have, you would have moved forward to get the, the scheme designed to uh, uh, what's called target cost stage, and then. Uh, when funding became available, you'd move to the construction contract. So probably that, that procurement phase, Colin, you can keep me right here, would have been 18 months, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yes, that, the, the initial initial procurement um, to, to get it out to the market usually takes between six and eight months to do that. Uh, yes, and as John says, we would move into sort of a, a two-stage process where stage one would allow uh, early contractor involvement and development of the scheme. Uh, that process alone usually takes in the order of 10 to 12 months um, before we move into stage two, which would be the, the construction phase subject to the funding at that point. Thank you. So I, su I suppose the key point there is that we, you know, we get the review done, yeah. uh, we see what happens, see what imp if, if any impacts on uh, current statutory approvals, and then once that's done, then you have the conversation about uh, moving forward to uh, if it's prioritised and in procurement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson.
Uh, thank you, Chair. And I know none of you will be surprised to hear me express the disappointment and the frustration in Derry and west of the band uh, when the decision was made with regards to a further delay of the A5. And there's massive support uh, for, the, for the A5. I think there's recognition that this is a vitally important scheme, that it will save lives, it will advance economic development, and it will also tackle regional inequalities. So many of us believed and were under the impression that the 2019 updated environmental statement, um, that, that that was having an impact to ensure that this project was watertight and ready to proceed to construction. However, as we know, the PAC report uh, of the public inquiry, they weren't satisfied with the efforts that were taken to properly prepare the scheme for construction. And for example, he says, for not taking account of the most recent flooding data. So going into the public inquiry in 2020, did the department um, have those concerns over the preparation and have the homework done and the work ready and believe that this was going to allow for construction because it seems to me going into the inquiry and for the inquiry to point to those things, um, I question um, how equipped was the department going into this public inquiry? Okay, but I'll, I'll maybe lead off on this and then maybe Seamus if you come in as well. So the, the, the purpose of the inquiry is uh, to uh, complete uh, essentially uh, the environmental processes, so to allow the minister to make a decision. Um, you know, the inquiry itself was seven days long. Uh, it dealt with a whole range of, of issues, very complex issues that were you know, presented by the department. Um, uh, 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 the inspector listened to the department's case and, and representations from uh, uh, other people. Um, so it, 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 it was uh, a, a long period of time and dealt with a lot of issues. So uh, Seamus, in terms of the, the kind of our approach to this and the approach to flood risk, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, um, as you've alluded to there, John, it was, you know, it was one theme within uh, seven days of the public inquiry. And PEC simply couldn't be persuaded the department uh, that the flood risk assessment was sufficiently up to date and taken into account the more extreme events in the northwest of December 15 and August 2017. Mm -hmm. And in addition, then there was technical guidance came out in 2019 as well. So, the, yes, a decision was made not to update the flood risk assessment in 2018. Uh, for a good reason, and that it would have taken a long time to go back over that again, and probably perhaps a year at least to, to redo an assessment. So it was felt that it was appropriate at that time, but it was one issue that the, the, the commissioner did pick up on. And I think that was, uh, you know, where he lost confidence in her assessment was in the fact that there was a 2015 and 2017 extreme events in the Northwest, which you'd be well aware of. And uh, he, we just couldn't convince him that you know, our flood modelling was sufficient to take into account those extreme events. So, and maybe just that, so essentially we, we put forward our best foot and the commissioner disagreed with us. I think the other point actually to make on that, Seamus, do you want to say something about the number of representations on that we actually had on flooding? Yeah, as you say, it was a well, it was one of many issues raised in the inquiry, and uh, yeah, of the 264 representations made, there was only eight that actually mentioned flooding in, in, in a passing context. Uh, yes, we are going, to, going through the uh, flood uh, flood prone area through the, 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 alongside the foil uh, north of Saban, unavoidably. Uh, but uh, yes, that was raised in by a small number of people uh, at the inquiry. Can I ask, Chair, or can I state that, you know, there's a general feeling that um, this is like an A5 Groundhog Day scenario where, you know, there's a delay in the scheme, 
that causes documents relating to the statutory process needing updated, which then, uh, w- which will then uh, be followed by a public consultation. And then after this, a legal challenge will delay things more and, you know, which will then lead to documents needing to be updated again. And it's like a circular issue. So can the department provide assurance today that they will have all their ducks in a row and all the necessary documents prepared so that we can finally see boots on the ground for this vital project? Because I'm concerned, Chair, that... I mean, this is a third public inquiry and uh, people nearly feel now we're going into a fourth, even though it's in a continuation of the, of, the, of the same one. And this has gone on 15 years. It's simply not good enough for anybody who could stand back and tell you what's coming down the track at us would let us know that these, what, these are the issues that need to be resolved in order to get this finalised and get construction started. So can the department provide some insurance to us today? So we're, we, we're bound by the statutory processes and they're set out in the roads order. So we have to follow those processes. Um, as I said earlier, we're focused on charting a pathway through this, uh, dealing with all the various risks. Uh, and that's all we can do. We have to, we have to follow the processes. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, the point of an inquiry is to get uh, uh, a, a recommendation from an independent ins- inspector that the minister can uh, take account of in considering whether or not to proceed with the scheme. So um, we we have to work our way through that. The, the, the point you make about legal challenge, and this has been challenged on um, three occasions, is it, um, Seamus? Three to date, yeah. Three, three to date. Uh, a, a, a legal challenge is is out with our control, uh, and, and we, we've had to deal with those um, um, through the process. But the pathway that we're we're working our way through at the minute, we're guided by senior counsel uh, to make sure that uh, uh, risks are mitigated and that we get to a point where we can get over the line here. Uh, and and that, you know, that's the assurance I can give you that, that we have essentially a senior counsel on our team directing us here to mitigate those risks. Anything else to add, James? No, um, not really, John. I've just, you know, we just cannot say that it's risk free because there are risks all the time. There's new emerging legislation and different policies. and. Uh, you know, it's never risk-free, but as, as John says, we do our best here with now with senior counsel on board to try and, and, get a, and get a pathway through all of this. Maybe we should have had senior counsel 15 years ago. This is an absolute scandal. It's outrageous because what we're talking about here is saving lives and cutting down in journey time as well as the economy and tackling regional inequalities. But what we're talking about saving lives 15 years on. And we're talking about we're we're focusing on a, a, on a, on chartering a, a new pathway. I mean, what pathway have we been walking on for fifteen years? And then you know we're going to work our way through this. We've been working our way through it for fifteen years. So I would say to the department, look, we need to really demonstrate to people in Derry, to people in West Demand, that the processes that we're putting in place now that we're not going to be sitting here or other people sitting here in five, ten, fifteen years' time having the same conversation. And as a consequence of processes that may be coming up in front of the department, people will die as a consequence of the A5 not being built. That's a reality. We're talking about people are dying and have died as a consequence of this road not being built. So we need to be moving forward. I'm sorry, Chair, but the people of my constituency and the people around the Northwest for 15 years, um, they've had enough of this. And they really do want to have confidence instilled in them that we will be first and foremost saving lives by trying to get this road and this construction done. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair. And I know we're taking the time, so I just have two questions that I'll, I'll go through quite quickly. Um, and I know others have talked about their the the public inquiry, the 2020 public inquiry into the AF5. Um, and how it would be just an examination of the updated 
environmental statement, but it seems that the PSA allowed um, for the whole rationale for the scheme to be re-examined at the, the, pub, the March public inquiry. Is that the case? And if so, could you give me a wee bit more detail on that? Seamus, should you take that one? Um, yes, uh, the Commissioner, well, initially we were looking at certain points in the updated environmental statement and uh, we, we thought as a department, you know, that that was going to be, yes, the focus of an inquiry, but the scope of the inquiry was challenged then by the turn of A5 Alliance and it was broadened out then to, to cover these wider issues. And uh, the advice again from our council was that, yes, we, the easiest, uh, most efficient way through this is to allow all uh, issues to be heard through the inquiry. And that's why, we, yes, we went back through all of those issues. Okay, and I suppose then, uh, in relation to that, the, the 2016 inquiry concluded that that the scheme was uh, um, of major public significance and, and that um, it should go ahead. But then the, the, the most recent inquiry has said that um, it has recommended for further documents on the issue. So, you know, it, it's can you explain that a wee bit more about what, what had changed in that time and, and why then in, this, in the, the most recent inquiry um, we are looking at, more, at further information? So maybe I'll kick off on that one. So the, the, after the 2016 inquiry, um, the inspector uh, recommended the scheme could, should proceed. Um, this was in the time when we had no minister. So um, the, the uh, department made the decision to proceed with the scheme and made the orders. So that was essentially at that time in November 17, the go ahead for the scheme. But that, that was then legal, legally challenged on, on 10 grounds, some environmental, but the ground that it actually fell on was the ability of uh, a senior civil servant to make a decision uh, in the absence of the minister. Uh, and that's then why we had to restart the process to try and make to make a new decision, which led to the 2020 inquiry. Now, your question was, what's different? Uh, really, uh, uh, it was a new process that uh, brought in, uh, I suppose, other issues, and uh, the, the the inspector uh, just came to a different view. Is that is that fair enough comment, James? On, on yeah. The the commissioner on this occasion said that he wouldn't be bounded by what uh, the previous commissioner had said and that he was uh, holding an independent inquiry and and so and he came out with uh, different conclusions and said yeah. so i think one other point to make is uh, you know, I mentioned about the process and the the, the process that we're in and, and uh, it, it's set in the roads order uh, and you know, we, that is due process, and, and, and we have to be respectful of that. Okay, no, th thank you. And I suppose just with all that in the round and, and light of previous comments there about delays and, and how long this has been going on, you know, with um, with the reopening of the, the public inquiry expected early next year, is there an, an indicative timeline then of when a decision could be expected and, and when construction may start, or are we still, is that kind of still unknown? Seamus, you want to take that one? Um, well, in, in broad terms, uh, if you have an inquiry, you would uh, typically then have six months before the PAC report, the final PAC report would come out. Now, if that was all positive, uh, then that would all be taken to the Minister of the Day, and he or she would make a decision on whether to proceed with the scheme. And uh, if that was a positive, um, then you could be looking at construction in within six months after that when the, the orders would come into play. However, you know, the, the, a legal challenge could obviously, you know, get in the way of all of that as well. Okay. No, thank you both. I think that that's been helpful anyway. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> I, I too uh, remain concerned that improvements to the A5 are not happening, in particular the bypasses to uh, Straban and Oma are being delayed by this insistence to have one complete package, um, where there are many, many difficulties uh, very evident in the in the Commissioner's report. And that also means that roads improvements along the roof 
route which could improve road safety are also being delayed. So I, I would like to uh, come back to the issue of phasing, which I think is critical. Um, and in the Commissioner's report, he said he found that phase three of the scheme, Ballygully to Ogmently, offers no significant benefits and represents over provision. Now, uh, in the document, in your response, you've said you're, you're accepting the human rights requirements. But do you, do you accept that if there's no significant benefits in part of the scheme and it represents over provision, there's a huge hurdle, to, uh, uh, a huge mountain to climb in terms of uh, um, overcoming human rights protections that exist for, for members of the public? Jim, should you take that one, please? Yeah, um, on the issue of phase two, um, this is an executive scheme, a flagship project. Um, it's for the entire length of the scheme, and therefore that's why we've retained the full length. Um, there are advantages uh, in retaining phase three, particularly in, in terms of consistency of route, uh, right through to across the border uh, to the N2, who are now working and uh, improving their section now as well. Um, so it's something we need to look at in more detail in terms of um, tease out those three benefits of phase three. Um, but at, at this point in time, um, we consider it appropriate that it remains as part of the flagship project overall. Can you just clarify the issue of phasing? Because in your response to the Commissioner's report, you seem to reject phasing. Uh, is that now being considered? I think the issue we have with phasing is that a decision was made by executive many years ago on terms of the phasing phase 1A and phase 1B, which are Straban to, to, to Derry End and then the Oma to Valley Gully. Um, and our environmental assessments are based around that then. And so that's quite fixed and that leaves us with a problem in terms of flexibility. Um, that's something we're looking at currently, but as it stands at the minute, um, our environmental assessments are based around that programming decided by the executive at the time. And uh, we've, we've, we've stuck by that. We, you know, for environmental assessment reasons, we've had to stick by it essentially. The, the commissioner's language is, is quite strong. Phase three is unjustifiable and should be removed. Are you saying that the executive have set you an impossible challenge and £80 million to date and future investment may well all go down the, the drain unless there is reasonable accommodation and, and flexibility given to you in this process? John, you comment on that one? So, I, I think I think so. When the minister, at the end of this process, the minister has to take account of um, what the inspector says, uh, and make, but ultimately it'd be a decision for a minister with regard to uh, whether uh, with regard to phase three. So she will look at comments and then have to uh, weigh it up and, and make a decision after the whole process is finished. But would you accept that if, if, if she chooses to ignore such strong direction and language, there's likely to be a judicial review which she will lose? So that, that's one to deal with when that decision-making process actually happens, I think. I, I just think it's a terrible waste of public money if, if that's the route we're going on. And not only that, more lives will be put at risk because we are, we are delaying vital improvements and actually continuing to have elongated journey times by not starting work along this route. A final point then, climate change has become increasingly important. I think everybody recognised that there has to be work uh, uh, to uh, 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 mitigate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. Do you accept that um, a new climate change bill, which Northern Ireland is, is going to be taking of, of some sort, no one knows the, the final shape, but nevertheless, in terms of putting down significant amounts of tarmacs, of going across green land, perhaps interrupting uh, environmentally sensitive areas, when they offer no significant benefit and represents over provision, will make it increasingly difficult for you, difficult for you to achieve uh, planning permission and sustain that in the courts. 
so uh, j just to deal with that, and, and we, we, we climate, there's, there's obviously a bill going through at the minute, and uh, we, we've indicated in our interdepartmental statement that we'll have to take into, into uh, that into account. But in general terms, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in in the widest policy terms, there, there will be uh, overs and unders in terms of of what uh, you. Know, uh, policies for road building, energy, whatever, uh, deliver in, in, in terms of climate change, uh, and so the economic and economic benefits of, say, for example, uh, and safety benefits of a road like the A5 uh, may, will have to be weighed against uh, you know, climate change objectives, and, uh, and you know that, that that's something that uh, climate change and the bill, uh, and we'll have to see where that ends up. Uh, uh, um, but, but it's something that we have indicated in the interim departmental statement that we have to take account of. Anything else? Um, you would be seriously looking at uh, perhaps some sections being upgraded to improve road safety and, tra and tra travelling times rather than this entire new uh, greenfield route? Yeah. So, I think, Seamus, you, you made that point before. Do you want to come back in on that? Um, I I don't think we have a lot extra to add to that, John. Um, you know, yes, as you say, we'll take climate change into account and the minister will have to take into account the legislation of the day at the point of her decision making. Um, currently, that legislation isn't there, but you know, we're mindful of it and it's something we'll, we'll certainly be keeping a very close eye on going forward. My question is, will you be considering uh, upgrades to sections of the existing route instead of an entirely new green field? Uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know, that, that is something that we're considering or are doing a report on uh, at the minute in terms of the alternatives, and we're looking at those, those options. Okay, thank you. Um, as and those will be put forward in the environment statement later this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'd be remiss if not to make comment um, on the FI, uh, given uh, my colleague, Johnny McCrossan's uh, campaign and interest in it. But I noticed it was the third legal challenge by the FI Alliance. I just wonder, in terms of uh, the amounts of money that has been expended to date, in relation to legal challenges, you know, um, I'm, I'm just curious to, to know why you would ha why they would have three different legal challenges uh, rather than a comprehensive one legal challenge. You know, and I know how these things can go on almost ad infinitum. And the other one I wanted to ask in terms of um, what we you know are the difficult re resource constraints within the department. Uh, what um, what impact have those had in relation to the timing or if the commissioner makes their judgment and gives the time frame irrespective of resource implications for the department? So in terms of the, the resources we have uh, to deliver this, uh, you know, in terms of people and our, our uh, uh, consulting engineers, that, you know, that's, that, that doesn't, there's no constraint there. Um, in terms of <clears throat> you, your question about the three legal challenges, uh, so as part of the process, um, you, as I said about the roads order, you, you go through uh, a publication of environmental statement, you make representations, have an inquiry, and then there's a decision to proceed. It's that decision to proceed that's challenged. So uh, <clears throat> the reason that you have three challenges is because uh, it was challenged once and fell, we had to start again. It was challenged second, second time and fell, and we had to start again. And, and that's that's the reason there's different challenges because essentially, uh, if if a challenge is successful, you have to rewind, go back, and start the process again in terms of the statutory processes. Sorry, John, um, just to get my head round it. So, if, if the legal challenges fail. Did, did, uh, did the fall by the applicant in terms of those making the challenge? No, no, they they, they won the challenge uh, yeah. eventually, and that meant that um, the uh, uh, the the decision, the so orders are quite so. Uh, 
the, the, way, the way a scheme goes forward is a minister will make a notice of decision to proceed and publish orders. If that's, the orders are challenged. If, if the challenge wins, then the orders are quashed and you have to then make a new decision. That's what's happened three times. <laughs> well, uh, I'd heard recently, John, and sorry, Chair, just uh, uh, that um, there's now a uh, ability for um, parties outside of uh, Northern Ireland to um, supply funding for challenges. Is that a concern? Is that a reality or is that a concern in relation to? I'm, I'm not aware of that, are you, Shims? No, I'm not aware of that. Um, however, through any process, you know, obviously the people have, uh, if they have concerns, they're absolutely entitled to object, and, and that's the process we're in. But I, 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 think that, yeah. I would always support people's, you know, ability to um, make decisions, but surely the consultation process would have been an opportunity for people to have had their voices heard and those um, concerns to have been raised and considered. And I take it that uh, was very comprehensively done on each of those occasions. Yeah, and you know, the A5A had their objections heard through the inquiry process at three different times, as you say. But that's one part of the process is when the, actual, when the minister actually makes a decision then, and that's when the legal challenge can come in. Uh, and that's a different process again. I, I, think, I think it's important. So I mentioned this road order process. So, People are entitled to make representations. Um, the process then has to deal with that. Um, and, 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 and weighing up that at the various stages, you know, that, that's the, the, the minister has to take into account of, of lots of information before making a decision uh, to proceed. It's that decision and the orders then that, that uh, uh, can be challenged. Well, I just want to reiterate that our party, and indeed, I think the minister has said even yesterday again about um, you know rebalancing um, investment and infrastructure right across the north, particularly west of the van. And I would hope that there's no you know this is the last time we have to hear a presentation where there's a, a, a an inquiry uh, being elongated <laughs> into another year. Yeah, but, but I, I, I have to reiterate again that you know, this, is the, this is the statutory process that we, we must diligently follow. I appreciate that, that John, and, and uh, I'm not suggesting otherwise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, John, Colin, Seamus, can thank you very much for your time um, this morning. And again, no doubt we'll, we'll be revisiting this issue again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, moving. I'm conscious of our time. Just moving on to any other business. And I suppose this was remiss of me. And I suppose I was reflecting on last week's um, meeting um, with regards to the presentation made by Nilga and Solis around um, EU successor funding, and particularly around the Leveling Up Fund. And I understand that bids have to be submitted by the 18th of June. And I was just conscious that we hadn't then made any correspondence with the Minister. And if members are content, that perhaps that we do write to her just with regards to that bid and what engagement um, she has had and the department officials have had with each of the councils and what the substance of the bid that she'll be making from the department will be, if members are content that we do that. Okay, thank you. Mr Muir, you've indicated. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I sent this through to the, the staff beforehand. But um, as we know, our city and town centres are starting to come back to life again as a result of the uh, relaxation of the restrictions. But also, there's still many more people are going to our beaches and beauty spots. Um, one of the key issues around that, which is related to the department, which is the deployment of traffic attendants. Um, I'm trying to get an ascertain of a plan for the deployment of them over the months ahead. I've had particular issues in relation to North Down and in Helens Bay, where the need for traffic attendants to come down and enforce parking restrictions. Um, I do welcome the activity to date, but there's a need for much more. Uh, there's a need for activity outside the normal nine to five. It needs to be in the morning, it needs to be in the evening, it needs to be at the weekends. To be fair, the responses from the Minister to date have been very poor and not shown a level of uh, interest in the issue that is required. So I was going to propose that we as a committee write to the Minister, asking her for an update on what the plans are for the deployment of traffic attendants in both our city and town centres, but also be, uh, beaches and beauty spots, to ensure that these uh, parking restrictions are enforced. 
These parking restrictions are in place, but they're not being enforced, and that's wrong. Okay, members content? Yep. Okay, anyone else? Any other issues that they wish to raise at this stage? Sorry? Uh, oh, Mr. Buchanan? Chair, just to confirm, at the start of the meeting, I raised the point about yep. writing to the uh, Minister to get additional support for bus and coach. Has that been agreed with the committee yes. to do that? Yes, it was. It was. You okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, members content. Our next meeting, oh, sorry, forward work programme. I skipped an item. Um, that's at page 100. Members content with that? Okay, thank you. Our next meeting will take place at 9.30 um, in room 29 on Wednesday, the 19th of May. And that's really a, an inquiry day. So we'll have briefings from RAIS, from the department, and from EVANI just in relation to the inquiry um, piece that we're carrying out. So if members are content with that. Um, and just advise members as they are leaving to maintain their social distancing. And thank you all for your attendance and your questions today. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Assembly, Senate Chamber. Thank you. Program signed.